I was told I have to tell you who I am and why I'm here and not somebody else. And uh, that's very funny for me. I never do that. But at any rate, I should tell you, as was indicated, the first 50 years of my professional life was spent becoming a certified quantum mechanic. I know where from I speak when I talk about quantum mechanics. I started out being a particle physics phenomenologist. I moved into formal quantum field theory and, in particular, non-perturbative techniques in quantum field theory. That led to my moving into solid state physics and condensed matter theory. And then finally, I ended up talk, working on the subject that I'll be talking to you about today. Now, obviously, I had no restrictions on what I did, OK? I had the world's greatest job. So the real question is, why did I leave it? I mean, I told people, my job description when I got tenure at Slack, it was a one-liner. It said, you are to do anything you feel like doing for the rest of your time here, <laughs> as long as you think it's good science. So I mean, why the hell did I retire to do this nonsense? <laughs> and the answer is because six years ago, I co-invented dynamic quantum clustering, or DQC. And I created the company. I mean, Stanford patented it right away. And there are three patents that surround this technology now. And my company controls the exclusive rights to those patents. Um, but the reason I, I wanted to make the company go, and it was clear Stanford wasn't going to make it go. Their idea of how they develop something is they tell the person who invented it, go out and make a company. And, uh, <laughs> And it, it, you, know, you can try to avoid that for a couple of years, and then you say, it really isn't going to happen unless I do it. So I did it. And why? Because I'm not a bad physicist, and I've done a lot of neat things. I never saved anybody's life. And I think this has the potential to do that. And that's why I'm here today to talk to you. And it's also why I've changed what I'm going to talk about. Okay, So what is dynamic quantum clustering? It is a really different way of looking at data. It opens up stuff that I don't think anybody really does, except DQC. Uh, it basically solves the problem of how do I find unexpected information. I know nothing about the data. I'm looking for unexpected information that I don't know how to look for, and it's hidden in my large, noisy, messy, big data set, high dimension. Okay, Or I like the other quote. How can I find the needle in my multidimensional haystack if I have no clue what a needle is and there's no guarantee it's in my haystack? Okay, so I need a way of looking for things which can't use a predefined search strategy. Okay, one way to do this, Adam saw us in the audience and we had a fight about this. I love losing fights. I lost one to Adam. He said, well, it's generally clustering. And I said, no, it's not. And, and then I went back and I said, well, it's been a long time since I went to Wikipedia and looked up the definition of clustering. I said, clustering didn't mean looking for long, complex, extended structures in the data. Well, it turns out that's wrong. I was wrong. Clustering, since I looked last, got that as part of the thing. Not too many things do it, but that's what it is. But the, the typical ways of looking for unsupervised stuff will be hierarchical or k-means clustering. There are things called DB scan, HDB scan, the current gold standard for biology work, t -SNE HDB scan, uh, Gaussian modeling. All of these things have several requirements which we have to get rid of if we're looking for unexpected stuff. One is they need to clean the data. They have tunable parameters. They build assumptions into what clusters are, how many clusters there are, and what you're looking for. All of that gets in the way of letting the data tell you what's in the data. Okay? We need a way of letting the data talk to itself. Uh, DQC can do that. So how is DQC different? This is the 30,000 foot view of it. We can return to it towards the end of my talk if I don't run out of time or people let me talk over. And that is, uh, what DQC does is it uses the data itself to create a proxy function, a function that is a proxy for the density of the data. This function has the property, wherever there's locally more data, it has a minimum. If there's a region of dense data along some curve, it has a trough, which is that. It has points of inflection in the curve. 
Basically, once you've got this function, the next problem which occurs, think of this as a topographical map, so I've drawn it in three dimensions, and the data is distributed. There are rivers in this map, river beds and stream beds where the data is more dense. And of course, because of fluctuations in data, statistical fluctuations, systematic errors, the data will be distributed up along the banks of those streams. So the name of the game is we just let everybody roll downhill into the stream, the nearest point in the stream. You'll see a movie that does that. That is, DQC is just the movie. The analysis is the movie, okay? And then uh, the stream beds will appear. You'll have understood the structure of density variation in the data. And then if there's more data at one end of the stream than another, things will slowly flow downstream to the ocean. The whole movie is telling you stuff about the data. The time to reach the stream bed is a measure of how far the data was. So just counting frames, you're able to get a measure uh, on the data, uh, a metric on the data, which is how far you are from the stream bed, okay? Uh, there are three nodes that define why DQC is really different, okay? And why it's better, faster, and cheaper if I were trying to pitch you and sell you something, okay? So first, no hypotheses. I mean, you know the typical thing when somebody has a data project, they put a bunch of smart people in a room, they yell at each other for several days, they come up with a hypothesis, and then they find out that hypothesis is wrong, and they go back into the room, and they hate each other at the end of this process because they've been yelling at each other. But it takes a lot of time. Analysts are expensive. Their time is money. And so, but worse, a hypothesis biases the result you can find. You've already gone in with an assumption of what the data has to tell you. You don't want to do that. The other thing is you don't clean the data. Now, I've been warned in Google I have to be very careful about saying this, so I'll be careful a little bit, okay? The whole question of cleaning data is a huge issue. There are many things you can do to data, including burning it, that I can't fix, okay? Uh, but in the sense that I only want your raw data, okay? That's what I work with. People ask me, you know, do you want the raw data or the process data? And I said, I want the raw data. And the guy says to me, nobody works with the raw data. I said, I want the wrong data. <laughs> don't, I don't want your fingerprints all over this data. You've already messed it up as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so you don't pre-process the data to remove noise. You don't process it to try to get out systematic artifacts that you know about. You just live with them. It'll be fine. They'll take care of themselves in the process. Uh, if the data is gapped in columns, think of the data generically as some big spreadsheet. If there are gaps in the columns, I don't care. I have plenty of examples where gap data work just fine. Okay, I mean, I'll put a minus one in for it or something like that, any kind of substitution. I need a number in there, but it doesn't have to be a sensible number. Okay, uh, so if I don't, have to clean my data, I've already saved a gigantic amount of time, okay? That's typically the place where an enormous amount of time is wasted. And then, I mean, I, I know people where you say, first thing your analyst comes in and says is, well, we have to clean your data. And then he goes away for six months, and then he comes back and says, I couldn't clean your data. So the project's over, pay me, okay? Uh, no, analyst time is money, and you have the danger again of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. If you don't know what you're looking for, starting to clean it means you're gonna throw away everything but what you think you might be interested in. And the third thing is you don't need expert knowledge in the first stage of an analysis. That doesn't mean subject matter experts aren't needed. It means you run the analysis, you see what you see, and then you call in the subject matter expert to say, what the hell am I seeing over here, okay? And so, uh, of course, subject matter experts are the most expensive analysts you're gonna find, so not wasting their time in the beginning is a big deal. Here you see three analyses, okay? Now, th this is fun, okay? This is one we completely understand. This was done as an exercise. This is Sloan Digital Sky Survey data. These are 350,000 galaxies, the coordinates, are the angles, theta and phi on the sky, and the redshift, meaning the distance of the galaxy from us. You've read the New York Times, I hope most of you, or else Facebook showed it to you or something. <laughs> and they told you that 
Galaxies are distributed in filaments, filamentary structure of high density, and voids. This shows you at the beginning, it's not so easy to see. The way that's done is very complicated and took a long time. This is DQC running on that data, pulling the data, the galaxies, back to the higher density regions. That is the right answer. So number one, that's impressive. But number two, what's more impressive is the structure of what I'm showing you. Because I don't know of any other way to see a complex interlocking structure of filaments like that, the real structure of the data using any other clustering algorithm. That's not possible in my knowledge. Here you're looking at data from a hyperspectral camera. It starts out looking like a hairball and it contracts to this extended structure of filaments. That's the kind of thing I was telling you. In this case, that stuff is related to things that are really going on on the, gro on the ground. This is a picture of a quarry in upstate New York. And the camera is a mega, half a megapixel camera that's taking uh, frequency spectra for the half a million pixels and 512 frequencies. So I have a half a million, 512 dimensional pieces of data. And the question is, which ones look more like one another? Why is that interesting? Because light is reflected from the ground. Suppose I am the military, which is not my favorite customer, but let's say I'm the military and I have a tank in a desert and it's been camouflaged to look like the sand. Okay. Well, it's been camouflaged to look like the sand in the visible frequencies, but it doesn't look like the sand in the non-visible frequencies. So if I look at who's like one another, an area of the shape of the tank will appear in the data, okay? And it will be visible to a hyperspectral camera which can be mounted in a drone and flown over the area. So that's pretty cool. It's also of use to Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola. Of course, they're the biggest corn growers in the world. And they uh, have huge fields of corn. They need the high fructose corn syrup, which is killing us all, but that's fine. This is business. And <laughs> At any rate, this can find problems in the fields, and it can do it in a very effective way. So that's a, a cool thing about that. On the very far left there is cancer data, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. And why do I want to talk to you about the cancer data? Cancer is a problem that everybody understands is a big deal. We've all lost people we love to cancer, okay? Uh, you also all know cancer is a hard problem. So if I show you stuff you never knew about cancer data, I hope that impresses you, that we've seen something that nobody has seen before, okay? Uh, and so that will be where the focus is. But before I do that, let me give you a little bit more of the story of what you see, okay? Because when you see the DQC movie and something like that appears, this is sort of the, uh, the progenitors of the zoo of shapes that saw up in a movie. If the data had little regions on the left, which were obviously separable clusters, DQC will show you points. The points will be moved together to the centroid of the region. Okay? If the data has something which, let's say, Ayazdi would say, oh, that's a candidate for regression, and then they call in their favorite regressor and say, please give me a model for this data, DQC will show you the line that it would have regressed to. Okay? And I'll, I'll show you how that could possibly happen, because it seems strange. And if uh, there is a flare, which people talk about, places where the data join, showing you, oh, this has been going on this way for a long time, and then two different things can happen, and the data ends up in two slowly changing characteristics, then DQC will show you that. And if you look carefully there, you're seeing it, okay? The flares are just completely revealed and it happens automatically. You're not doing anything to extract that from the data. DQC is doing that. And f finally, finding circles and things, which are the problems everybody likes to talk about. It's a piece of cake. I don't care about it. Okay, <laughs> it happens when it happens. All right, what's automatic regression? Because that's a crazy idea. There is a posting on LinkedIn that I did, which I call turbocharging uh, predictive analytics. But what was it really about? It was really about how you could have knocked 200 years off the discovery of the ideal gas law had you had this technology, okay? Why do I say that? Because Boyle and Charles, 1800s or so, they 
identify Boyle's law and Charles's law. They're looking either at how P and V are related if you hold T fixed or P and T are related if you hold V fixed. And then it's 200 years later that Carathéodore says, no, no, P times V is T, okay? And getting all that put together and dealing with the statistical problems in the data and everything else, it's a huge problem. So I did this as a fun exercise. I said, suppose I generate 6,000 independent values of P and V and then calculate T. And if I was able to plot in three dimensions a few hundred years ago, then I would have seen something that looks a lot like the red surface there. I can tell you what that red surface is. It's a messed up version of what I would have seen. Now, that would be cool because once you see a two-dimensional surface, you finished. You've said, oh, there's a law of physics. Because not every, what is a law of physics? If I'm now teaching in my class, right? A law of physics is the statement that not everything you can measure about a system is independent. If you know some of the variables, you can predict the other ones. That's what gives you control. That's what lets you make refrigerators, okay? Had they just had the surface, they would have been in the position to start the engineering program to build the first refrigerator, okay? That's all they needed, okay? So you don't need the formula yet. The surface, a lookup table. You know, if you were my age, you would remember when sines and cosines were not gotten at the computer but you actually went to look at tables of sines and cosines and then you interpolated the values to get the number you wanted, okay? So here, you would have seen that right away. All of that power would be at your disposal. The problem is data is never that good. Data is messy. So what I did was I took those 6,000 points and generated another 66,000 points by taking each PV and T value and multiplying it by a number chosen from three independent random distributions centered at one with a width of about 0.1. So there's 10% errors roughly in that data. And the fuzzy blue surface is what you see. Now what's true? If it is actually an underlying surface in the data, and I messed it up that way, the random distributions, the high density region is the surface. So what you're seeing is DQC coalescing the data down onto the nearest high density region, which is the surface. And then it buries itself in the surface. Now, it buries itself in the red surface. The red surface is the best answer I could have gotten because I took every 12 points that I had generated from a single point and I averaged them. And because, of course, I have a small set of statistics, the mean value isn't the surface. It's a little bit thing. So that red surface shows you the degree to which the data is messed up which would have been improved by having more data. And then the only question is, why is it pulling away from the edge in the later frames? By the way, you're looking at 1,000 frames. All of the interesting th happens in the first 60. Then the thing stops moving. <coughs> why did it stop moving? Because the central region has roughly equal density. And so DQC has no reason to move the points around anymore, okay? It's pulling away from the edges for the same reason. The proxy function goes up where there's no data sharply. And so data that's out in that region rolls down and pulls in from the surface and then looks around and says, oh, no problem, I'll stop right here, okay? So that's what I mean by automatic regression. So that means basically if there are formulas, unknown relations hidden in your data, what will DQC do? It'll regress the stuff automatically to the formula. Then if there's a variation in the distribution of the data, it'll slowly change. That's why the whole movie matters. First you see the stuff happen, and then it'll slowly change in response to small variations. All right, so now I'm gonna to go to cancer data, and I'm gonna to try to finish this all in the requisite amount of time. So basically, uh, this is a problem where uh, I gave a talk at SETI, and uh, someone who shall remain nameless in the audience noticed that this was sort of interesting and he said, I have a biologist friend who would love to talk to you about this. And so in the end, he said, well, this is a really great idea and I'd like to do stuff with you and collaborate, but first, in order to have my clients believe you, we need to do a problem that biologists will understand. I said, fine. So he went to an NIH database that had 25,000 tumors in it, and uh, it had all kinds of DNA 
sequence information, it had mRNA expression information for each tumor, and a whole bunch of other things. He pulled out 10 percent of that data, and there were five different kinds of tumors. There was uh, bladder cancer, glioblastoma multiforme, we all know what that is now because that's what John McCain has, okay, low-grade gliomas, which are same cell but a much less serious cancer. They're all serious. Ovarian cancer and thyroid cancer. The colors on the left are the colors I colored the data with, so you would see it. You're looking at, well, when I first did this, I did the SVD decomposition for the 73,800 mRNA genes I was given, okay, and I saw that shape. I clustered it, saw that the cancer separated in an obvious way, and from that, DQC has an algorithm for pulling out the most important genes for that shape. Having done that, what you're seeing there is exactly the same starting point, uh, but for only the 48 genes that were identified as important. And basically, what do you see? You immediately see the brain cancer separate like crazy. The glioblastoma multiforma is very different from the low-grade gliomas. The thyroid cancers cluster, but they don't coalesce to a single disease. I mean, remember, the colors are, a histologist looked at the cell and said, this is thyroid cancer. And I'm telling you, no, it's not. These are all different thyroid cancers. If I had sensitivity information to specific drugs, all I have to do is recolor that plot. And I say, well, yeah, it's true your drug doesn't cure everybody's thyroid cancer, but it cures these thyroid cancers 100% of the time, okay? This is the beginning of meeting the promise of precision medicine, okay? When you can see that these things are not single diseases, okay? Can I ask a quick question? Sure, I like questions. Uh, what are these axes? Are these like they're SVD axes, okay? They're linear combinations of genes, okay? Uh, that doesn't mean anything. I mean, I can, I, every point is identifiable all the time as a particular point in the original data set. So we can reach in and say, I want to know about these guys and I'll pull out the raw data for you, instantly. Do you feel like they automatically show you the axes that make more sense or? Uh, SVD, SVD is the Swiss Army knife of all this stuff, and I'm bringing coals to Newcastle, but I'll say it anyway. Um, all it's doing is finding a good set of coordinates to plot the data. The first three dimensions are the ones in which the data has the biggest extent. The next three, it has less. You, if, if you look at that at the beginning, there's no separation between these guys. And the separation occurs very quickly because not of what's going on in the first three dimensions, but what's going on in the other 48. To see everything we're seeing here, all 48 genes are playing a role, okay? The reason these guys separate so fast and look so different from everybody else is when you reach in and pull out the clusters, you find out instead of expressing 48 genes, they only express 24. So in 48 dimensions, they live in a different place, and that's reflected in the clustering in the first three dimensions. Okay, so yes, if I wanted to bore you silly or maybe excite you but run out of time, I could plot all 48 dimensions for you. But you're seeing basically what's going on. What I want to focus you on is the red guys and the ovarian cancer guys, the cyan guys, are not moving very much. And the first question you'd like me to answer, I hope, is why aren't they moving at all? They look like they're so close together. Well, they're not close together in 48 dimensions. That's why they're very different, okay? However, let's, uh, the first question you would have asked, right, is what happens if you pull 48 random genes out, okay, and do the same game? 2,400 tumors, random genes. <laughs> That's what happens. I don't know if you noticed it. Let's go back. Look very careful at the evolution. It's about 10 frames of motion, and then it all stops. Random data always does that. Random data doesn't cluster in any significant way. That is what DQC shows you when there's nothing to look at in the data. So this is not random genes that are gonna do the job. That doesn't mean there's not something amazing going on in a lot of genes, okay? Here, just to show you what you can do with the data once you have the evolution. This, because I was challenged, somebody said, well, you have to tell people what the gold standard is doing on this data. So the gold points you see there, because it's the gold standard, 
is T-SNE HDB scan. When applied to this data, it finds brain cancer. But if you look carefully, it finds equal amounts of cluster in the glioblastoma multiforma and in the low-grade gliomas. It's not distinguishing glial cell cancers one from the other. Okay, and that's true of every cluster that HDB scan finds. So HDB scan can tell thyroid, it can tell ovarian, it can but it can't tell apart the brain cancers. It fails on them. And, and there's a reason, some of which we understand, for why that's happening. And it, it'll happen in a lot of data sets like this. And the reason is there's much more than one thing happening in this data set. And we have to be able to go through and pull out all the different things that are happening, okay? But as you see, the competition doesn't do too well on this, whereas DQC separates the glial cancers immediately from one another. They really are very different. If you average their gene expression and compare them, they're very different, okay? These are different diseases. However, the thing you should notice, because it's sort of fun, and stuff about it will be in the paper, as it forms, to begin with, you see an arch. Those are intermediate frames. The first thing that happened is there's a stream bed in which you see a low dimension structure that interpolates between glioblastoma multiforma and low grade glioma. Understanding that could be very, very important in treatment. Okay? Why is it important that in the beginning the glioblastoma is extended? I know this from personal sad experience. My first wife died of glioblastoma multiforma. And before, at the stage where John McCain is now, the doctors come to you and give you a choice. They say the choice is, are you going to have radiation or not have radiation? Well, it turns out glioblastoma multiforma can go one of two ways when confronted with radiation. It can become much more malignant or it can get a little bit better. We ended up in the bad side of that thing. But nobody knows how to tell them apart. But since in initially this is an extended structure, the hope would be if we had the radiation information, we could give advice. Are you a candidate for radiation or are you not a candidate for radiation? Because that's also not completely one disease. There's just a few other little things that we know. We know something about the age of the patient. I have no information about uh, their response to drugs and I have no information about their response to radiation but the data set has age. So always in these plots, the left-hand side is the original analysis colored by diagnosis. The right-hand thing, the red points are people over 40. The blue points are people under 40. Maybe somebody's equal to 40, I don't know. At any rate, the interesting thing is the glioblastoma multiforma is mostly people over 40. The low-grade gliomas in this data set are mostly people under 40. Okay, if we look out here, remember these guys didn't cluster well. Well, there's a reason. These guys over here are red. They're older people. They're tumors. I mean, why are older people interesting? As you get older, the errors in your genome crop up. The mRNA expression will become more random. And therefore, they should not look like younger people, even for the same, quote, disease. They don't. And so the reason these guys don't coalesce and the blue ones do, is the blue ones are younger people with a less messed up genome, but still big variation in the genome. The only other piece I have is the, the uh, <coughs> stage of the cancer. Okay, cancers are stage one, two, three, four, four A, four B. Okay, on this plot, the stage three and four cancers are yellow and red. So it's always the same movie. All I've done is change the coloring according to information that I have from sources that have nothing to do with the genome. Well, apparently have nothing to do with the genome. And <clears throat> you notice the guys that I told you were the red and the cyan, the ovarian, they don't move. Well, they also are the ones that are higher stage cancers, more messed up genomes. You expect them to be different in 48 dimensions, and they are. They don't cluster. These guys do, and this edge out here the yellow ones are there. They are, again, the more messed up genomes, and they shouldn't cluster with the blue ones, and they don't. So this is how you just work your way through the analysis at the first stage. Okay, but then a question comes up. What happens? I mean, I'm just trying to lead you right through the questions as they appear. What happens if I take these 48 genes out? I, do I see anything? Okay. 
Do you want to vote? Somebody want to take a guess? Am I going to see something? Am I going to see confetti? Am I going to see a mess? All right, nobody wants to guess. That's what I see. Okay, stunning. A totally different shape has appeared. The 48 genes are out. They were the most dominant ones in defining the shape. That doesn't mean it went away. There's another shape. Okay? And here's where I get my comeuppance, so I'll tell you about it. Okay? I looked at this and I said, oh, look, this is pretty good. I think what I'm seeing, because these are not really separated, what I'm seeing, and I said this to my colleague Alex Feltis, that, that um, I'm seeing the, the ordinary behavior of healthy cells. And Alex said, I don't believe that. He said, I believe what we're seeing is that cancer infiltrates the cell and hijacks the cellular machinery and leaves fingerprints all over the gene expression of the rest of the genes in the system. And I said, that's ridiculous. I know that the way that thing is going to cluster is the glioblastoma and the others are going to be the same cluster. I have a lot of experience running this stuff. You should never say you understand it. 48 dimensions later, <laughs> the glioblastoma and the low-grade glioma separate from one another beautifully. He's right. I'm wrong. I had a great day. I love being wrong. <laughs> so if I look down here in dimensions 4, 5, and 6, this is what I was telling you. The red guys live in an entirely different place from the cyan guys. So in fact, we just found out ovarian cancer is not, is not bladder cancer. But <laughs> it takes other dimensions to see that fact, OK? So uh, it's just dangerous to guess. I don't care how much experience you've had. The good thing is I can put all the bias I want into what I think is going to happen. DQC does what it wants. <laughs> That's what it did. That's what we saw. That was the end of the story. All right, so we're at, I'm told I have like 10 minutes left. Uh, is that about right? I promised John that I would pull back the curtain a little bit on the quantum mechanics. That means half of you should go to sleep. <laughs> OK? Uh, I, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I didn't do this to you. Blame him. OK? Uh, what do I first want to emphasize? Quantum mechanics in this is a trick. I am abusing what I know about quantum theory to do a problem that should be done classically, but it wouldn't be computable if it was done classically. I need an approach which is immensely parallelizable. If I have to do gradient descent to move things down the cliff, and there's millions of points and hundreds of dimensions, I don't know how many of you have done gradient descent. Well, you do in machine learning. So uh, in fact, you know, not so easy to find 800 minima and characterize their shape okay, in 500 dimensions. So we need something else. We need, as the person who taught me quantum mechanics, Bob Server, would say, we need a trick. And in this case, the trick is quantum mechanics, okay? Now, so I said, we're going to create a function that's a proxy for the density of the data. We're going to do that for two reasons. Then we're going to move the points, okay? I'm going to move ahead a little bit. So here is what Emmanuel Parson, an infinite long time ago, but had you read basic books on data mining or statistical analysis, you would have found that Parson, in fact, invented something called the Parson Estimator. He said, for each data point in n dimensions, I'll write a Gaussian, a bell curve. I'll add them all up, and I'll have a function. And where there's more data, I should have a maximum. And where there's less data, I should have a minimum. The problem is what you see here. The one parameter in the Gaussian gamma varies by a few percent, and what you see in terms of maximum and minima changes dramatically. The function is exquisitely sensitive to parameters. Anyway, characterizing lots of maxima in a function in n dimensions is very, very difficult. So the first step that faced us was how do we keep this idea but change what we do so that the function we have is not sensitive to changes of parameters. You can change parameters by 20% and you'll see the same structure, okay? 
This function has a lot of nice properties. The first of it is it's positive everywhere. It's either zero or positive. That makes it a candidate for an eigenfunction of a problem in quantum mechanics. Now, if you're a physicist like me, you know that problems in quantum mechanics, when you find the eigenfunctions of a potential of the force law for what's going on in the problem, wherever there is a maximum in the function, or wherever there's a minimum in the potential, there'll be a small maximum of the eigenfunction, okay? Or a point of inflection if the parameters are chosen. But the underlying potential will be much more stable representation of what's going on, because the reason for those little maxima is the uncertainty principle. It's the kinetic term in the problem, which is washing out the details. So we're just faced with a problem. We want to solve the Schrodinger equation. Del squared psi plus V times psi equals, it can be anything, so zero is perfectly good. That's a difference of a constant in V. And we just want to find V. Psi, we know. It's a sum of Gaussians. Del squared psi, we know how to compute. It's the sum of Gaussians multiplied by poly polynomials. <clears throat> v, even I can do this problem, and I'm not great at math, okay? I take this guy, and I move him over here, and I divide by this guy, and that's V, okay? That's, that's the way we solve the problem. So now we have an analytic form for the potential function. We don't want to have to work with it, but it's a great form, okay? So from that, here I have three Gaussians and 20% variations. The red curve is the potential function. The green curve is the wave function, psi, okay? Notice <laughs> the, gas, the, the potential function has very sharp features even when the Parson estimator has essentially no features. So you can run through a huge range of parameters and nothing changes. You'll find the same set of minima. Here, we're looking at two very, eight, three very asymmetrical distributions, different numbers of points with, as the parameters vary. And again, this guy is vanishing when this guy has enormously large features that we can exercise off of. So I've made my function, I've done what I promised you, I've made my function immensely insensitive to parameters, okay? And I've made it minima instead of maxima, which is also cool. Because with minima, I can just do gradient descent and find them. I can do gradient ascent, but that's even worse than gradient descent. This is how funny it can be, okay? This is a 10% or a 20%, I can't remember, 20% variation, and I'm showing you going from no visible features to what is apparently flat. The potential function has the structure we were looking for, and the original function can't see anything. You wouldn't be able to make any money off that function. So I hope I've convinced you now we've got a good candidate for a proxy for density. Now we just have to run guys downhill, as I promised you. I want to move the points. For that, I'll give you a name. I didn't write it down, so everybody take out your book. What I'm going to use is Ehrenfest's theorem. Ehrenfest's theorem says if I have a Gaussian sitting in a potential, and I evolve it using the Hamiltonian, solve the Schrodinger equation for the motion of that Gaussian, the center of the Gaussian will move according to Newton's laws and the potential if I don't go too far, okay? That's the heart of this trick, okay? The center follows Newton's laws. But the Gaussian can be, but the Hamiltonian can be reduced if I choose a basis to a matrix. And so exponentiating the, Gauss, the Hamiltonian and moving things is matrix multiplication. And I can do that on every single data point. You give me a million cores and I'll do it totally in parallel. And so a million guys will move delta t in one second. Okay, now I never have a million cores at my disposal, but if I had it, that would be what you could do. Okay, and so where are we? Because you're geeks, this is pseudocode for the algorithm, okay? Step one, read in data from a spreadsheet. I want rows and columns, okay? Two, do SVD and make the first frame of the movie. Single DQC command. Make tr first, first trajectory, boom, from the data that you did SVD on. Then you have to choose a basis. 
Now, what do I mean by choosing a basis? So this is a long story, and I'm not going to give you all the gory details. But basically, all of these Gaussians are vectors in Hilbert space, right? Everybody, who, who's going to follow me from the rest of this point? How many people know what vectors in Hilbert space are? All of you, none of you. This is going deep. OK, I'm already in trouble, OK? Uh, they're vectors. They're, they're not independent. They're vectors that look like this. So the question always is, how many vectors do I need to create all the other vectors as linear combinations of those vectors? The more important question is, if I only want to be accurate to 70%, how many vectors do I need in order to get 70% coverage of the data that I can reconstruct everybody and get that right at that level? That's how you pick a basis, OK? I mean, <laughs> this is a story about how you pick a basis, but that's it. Then you just have to evaluate in this basis the kinetic term, the potential term, and you, you try to keep the number of vectors in the basis by adjusting gamma so you don't need more than 1,500, 2,000 vectors because I don't want to be dealing with big matrices. And so by adjusting gamma, I can get very good coverage for a fixed number of vectors. And by the way, that's an algorithm for picking gamma for the problem. So that takes my freedom of choice out. Now I can only say, do I want 60% coverage or 50% coverage? And nothing changes very much. So I don't need to pick gamma. And then I build a Hamiltonian. I have to exponentiate that matrix, e to the minus i times a time step times the Hamiltonian. And then I just go around multiplying things. And every time I multiply, I find where the center of the packets are. And I start again. And I keep doing that. And so after that, it's just a loop. At the end of that loop, I have a movie, and then I just show you the movie. So what's going on is serious, underneath, complicated stuff, but the movie shows you everything that's happening. We don't need to know what's happening. We only have to know what it's telling me, and it's telling me where the higher density, locally higher density regions are. And so now the fun is you just go off and do whatever else you're interested in, because you've seen the structure of the data. It's told you where the whales are hidden in the data. OK, you're going to go down and do that. So DQC's benefits are basically defined by the three no's. No cleaning, no hypothesis, no expert knowledge. I hope I've convinced you it lets you find hidden, unexpected insights into big, dense data, even more so when there's multiple things going on in the data. It pulls out the levels of information just by following your nose. I mean, nobody expected this data to have stuff going on in tens of thousands of genes. But as you keep pulling more and more genes out, you keep seeing that other pot, the second pattern. And that means tens of thousands of genes have been polluted by the cancer. And just, it's, which tells you right away, it's really easy to convince yourself that you can diagnose based on information that has nothing to do with the cause. Okay. You have to know the data has this so that you can go in and see which is more important because the information is in tens of thousands of genes. It's not in a few genes. Okay. So this is a way of looking at this kind of data my colleague hasn't seen, I who don't know much about this kind of... I mean, the neat thing about this, why do I love this? I get to be what I always wanted to be, the consummate dilettante. I get to work on a problem not knowing what it is. I load in the data, I see something, my friend comes and says, that's interesting, and then we start talking. And so I only learn about the problem, what I discovered in the data, okay? And I get to work on field after field after field, and it's why, the answer to the question, why aren't other people using this, is I'm having such a good time, I'm not doing a good job of telling the story. <laughs> and Burton Richter, actually, who's one of my, uh, so he's a Nobel Prize winning physicist, he yells at me all the time. He says, you're having too good a time. <laughs> He's on my board and he yells at me, you're having too good a time. You're not out there getting this into the public. So now I am engaged uh, in, the, at any rate, the insights are there and they're stranger than you might have guessed, which lead me to quote Hamlet, that there are more things and well, therefore, as a stranger give it welcome, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy, okay? Data sets have more to see than you ever guessed they could have. And there is a tool that can pull the data apart in a way which lets you see it. 
This is information about the company. That's my information. You can get to me, and we can have a conversation. Okay? I'm done. Uh, the first question that was submitted beforehand is, what are the most promising applications for your technique, and how should Googlers think about potentially using it? I think you answered a little <laughs> bit of the first one. but um. Um, So the answer to that you know, it has to do with I'm a company now, and I've been told by people not to do certain things. So <laughs> the truth is, we're not telling anybody this, right? So uh, I don't care what the data comes from. <laughs> I, didn't, I don't use any knowledge of the data. So you can imagine what it's good for. However, I have to tell you, I'm really interested in pursuing one vertical market, because otherwise my advisors will tell me I'm doing a terrible thing. So I'm pursuing a single vertical. My first thing, frankly, is I'd love to, if there is a market there, look at uh, bio, medicine, and pharma, because I think I showed you that we have the potential to do precision medicine, and then I can solve my dream of saving lives, okay, which is what I'd really like to do. Uh, I have other examples, and I welcome people who want to have a discussion. I can stay here till 5 o'clock, okay? Uh, there are examples of this applied to market segmentation, examples applied to dealing with very noisy data, like finding contraband nuclear material, driving around the city of Chicago with a lousy handheld detector. Um, there are examples with hyperspectral camera information. There are examples. So you tell me what it's good for. I leave it in your lap. Uh, Googlers, at the moment, how can they think about how to apply it? Talk to me. I mean, it, it'll take some talking. Look, I'm telling you to do something that already violates everything that everybody's ever told you about looking at data, right? Uh, I'm telling you, don't clean your data. If you try to clean your data, I'm going to slap your hand. It's not what you learn in your statistics course, okay? The next thing I'm telling you is don't make a hypothesis because you're an idiot. You don't know what you're asking, okay? You're biasing the result. I mean, I have people who hate me for saying these things, but that's the best way to take a first look at data. The other stuff comes in when you've understood what's in your data, when it's shown you what it has to say to you, when it's told you its story. It has a story to tell, but you have to let it have a voice, okay? And this is the way to let it have a voice. There may be other ways to let it have a voice. I just don't know them, okay? And anyway, I love this one. It's my baby. I freely admit the bias, okay? But uh, I, I guess that's the answer to the question. And anybody who wants to talk to me, I'm more than happy to talk about it. In the example that you have there with the cancer cells, uh, did you plot uh, also healthy cells? I wish I knew that, right? We only had six cells. However, you saw, I had a hypothesis it was the healthy cell data, but I could nevertheless prove I was wrong by only looking at the six cell information. It took me a little while to realize all I had to do was evolve it and see what would happen. And if they separated, it wasn't healthy cell information because glioblastoma and low-grade glioma are the same cell. I couldn't tell from the other cells, but those two were an indicator. If they separated, the information was different for those two diseases, and therefore it wasn't healthy cell information. Mm -hmm. It was pollution of the genome by the cancer. I wish I had the information. I am now looking for people with data sets that have medical information, that have, I mean, all I have is the histologist said, this is thyroid cancer. Great for the histologist. It's 140 different cancers, okay? Even the glioblastoma, which is a pretty tight cluster, is still quite a while an extended structure. It's not one cancer, okay? The low-grade gliomas for sure are not, and there's a connection between them at early stages, okay? So what is all of that? Damned if I know. Is there more in this data that I didn't tell you about? Yes, but I'm outside of my wheelhouse if I talk about it. It's deeply biological information. I don't understand it. My colleague tells me, he doesn't understand it either, but the biologists are sure to be interested in it because nobody's ever seen that before. Okay, so uh, it, it just, it's so much fun to take a data set apart this way. I mean, you notice I never calculated a thing. <laughs> I just made movies. <laughs>
Yes. Uh, as far as I understand, uh, you're creating this uh, wave function, uh, like cr uh, treating those data points as probability distribution of a uh, no, uh, no, no, not probability. Like They're just okay. functions that are peaked at the data. Uh -huh. And then I'm adding them up, and I'm hoping that the resulting function has maxima where there's more data mm -hmm. and local minima where there's less data. So I'm plotting the density. Mm -hmm. If you start getting into probability questions and you try to understand this in some profound way about probability amplitudes, you're heading down a rabbit hole that you shouldn't be going down, okay? It's a trick. I, I, it's this enormous problem to me because people love quantum mechanics. It's, it's, I love quantum mechanics. It's fabulous. But I'm abusing quantum mechanics. I am taking what I know from quantum mechanics and, and all the years I spent knowing how to solve problems non-perturbatively. Okay? And I'm stealing them to do a problem which is like, it's not 100% like gradient descent. You really want to be mystified a little bit. Why can I work in 100 or 1,000 dimensions when other people fail in 10? Well, I happen to know why they fail. <laughs> the reason they fail is if you were to form this probability, this, uh, see, you got me doing it. Shame on you. At any rate, if you were to uh, take this uh, potential function and look at it under a microscope, you would see that little ripples form because as the dimension goes up, statistical, small statistical fluctuations start to happen a lot, okay? That's what everybody gets stuck in. If they try doing annealing or something like that, they find too many clusters. I want to see only the big shape that envelops that whole thing. So I didn't tell you about the other parameter in the problem. The other parameter which was set to one when I made the potential function is the mass of the particle that's moving. Quantum mechanics has a wonderful thing called tunneling. If I make that mass lower than one, like 0.1, it's not going to see the little minima. They vanish. It tunnels through them. So in fact, you only see the enveloping big potential. And so I can work, I have worked in 1,024 dimensions. So it jumps over. Uh, it, well, it, two things are happening. Is the mass, we'll go offline, OK? <laughs> not fair to other people for us to get it. Done. <laughs> Yes, but sometimes it just goes through. Um, another question from the Dory. Early quantum computers won't have many qubits or long coherence <laughs> times. How will you get big data sets into the machine before the qubits decohere? I'm not doing quantum computing. I'm doing <laughs> classical computing. I don't need to answer that question. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Uh, when have you found DQC is more effective than other ML techniques? Have you found heuristics as to why that is? I think you also answered a little bit of I, this. I, I tried to answer that all yeah. through this thing. I mean, I, I can say it again. So not only don't I care about the data, I don't care about the size of the data set, okay? If you run this on small data sets, which it was done, okay, there's something that people use for the small data sets called the Jacquard score. I think some of you were familiar with that. I don't like it but it's the figure of merit. So apply to small data sets, DQCs, your card scores run from 0.87 to 0.96. When I spoke to somebody at Hanford Labs, he was a spook. And he said, what kind of your card scores do you said? I said, I don't do that great. I do 0 0.86, 0 0.9. He said, I kill for 0.86, <laughs> okay? Uh, so we do very well, but why? Am I interested in small data sets? No. Why? Small data sets, anybody can get an answer on. When a data set has no separations in it when you plot it, there aren't many methods that can touch that problem, okay? The HDB scan says it can touch it. It only works up to 10 dimensions, number one, and it degrades badly in 10 dimensions. But number two, you also saw it gives the wrong answer for reasons that have to do when the data set is complex and more than one thing is going on, it doesn't know what it's looking for. DQC somehow avoids that. It's hidden in the density of the data in the high dimensions, okay? I mean, it's just, past that point, I already proved to you I can't visualize the data in 48 dimensions and tell you how the answer is gonna come out. Thought I did, but I was wrong. Nice thing is I can't make DQC do what I want. It'll do what it's gonna do. Um. Hi, um, I have a question. So, so if I have a 
large uh, high dimensional data set. Mm -hmm. Is there other use cases where you would not recommend UQC or? <laughs> I was telling these guys over lunch. Yeah. I love that question. So I'm a physicist. I believe everything has a failure mode. <laughs> okay, absolutely believe that with my gut. I spent five years trying to find a data set it doesn't work on. Okay, I thought I had it. Okay, I thought I had an Alzheimer's data set, which somebody gave me, and it was 1,500 Alzheimer's pay or 3,000. I don't remember, and it was 250,000 SNPs. And they said, so the information we want to know: can you see? people who would have late al onset Alzheimer's and people who won't based on these SNPs. And so I ran the data. So I don't know what I ran it in, but when I looked, it was something like 100, 150 dimensions was appropriate. I could get reconstruct the whole data set to the 1% level by that. So, so there's no point in running in 250,000 dimensions. OK, I'll run in 100 and something. I saw lots of stuff. Unfortunately, what I saw is what 23andMe sees or Ancestry.com, I saw what was probably, I didn't have the information, was most certainly uh, data that had to do with ethnicity, okay? But when I looked at all of the clusters that I had and I calculated the number of people who had been autopsied and shown to have Alzheimer's and the number that were autopsied and shown, so they all, unfortunately were all dead, and, I hope, and uh, <laughs> they, they were shown to have Alzheimer's and not have Alzheimer's, the distribution in the general population and the distribution in the clusters up to 1% variations is the same. So finally, after knocking myself out, trying to vary the parameters I have, and of course I couldn't get a different answer, I called the guys up and said, I'm sorry, you say this stuff there, I don't see a thing. There's just nothing Alzheimer's related in your data. I then gave a talk to the proteomics group at Stanford Hospital. And they asked me this wonderful question, what's your failure mode? And I said, I failed abysmally on the Alzheimer's data. And, and I was proud, I had a failure mode. And he said, um, I know the data set you just talked about. We worked on it for 10 years. There's nothing in that data set. <laughs> so, you know, my week spent looking at the data set four times was not in the end wasted, but I still don't know my failure mode. I'm sorry, I wish I knew it. No, it has to be there. You can't work on everything. Nothing works on everything. I just haven't gotten unlucky or lucky. I don't know which it would be. But it would be nice to know what the limitations are. Density variations is such a robust thing. It's such a different way of looking at the data that uh, it's hard to see when it fails. Thank you so much. Um, we have time maybe for one more question. If there's any live, we can also. I uh, get one from the Dory. Um, <clears throat> uh, this was sort of just asked, but what are the downsides to using DQC? Uh, why isn't everyone using it right now? I guess this is part <laughs> I, of the. I said it's my fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my wife is sitting here, so I don't want to say it again. She'll yell at me. It's my fault. It, in some sense, it's my fault. Okay. Uh, I don't think I've been the best spokesman for recruiting young people to jump on the bandwagon and start doing it because I've been having too good a time using it. And, and I guess that's been my problem through life, OK? I mean, I always got yelled at by the head of the lab that you got to write another paper. You're not sharing. He says, you're having too good a time knowing what we don't know, and you're not sharing. And uh, probably I don't share enough, right? So you invited me, and I'm sharing. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thank you for sitting through it. <laughs>